Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We are in a study of the book of Acts, but a couple of years ago, our elders, we had a conversation that we never wanted communion Sundays. We never wanted communion to just be something that we tacked on the end of a service. You know what I mean? Some, oh, by the way, we, we're going to have communion before you go. We wanted it to be meaningful, so we all agreed that I should do, you know, the music should be sort of head, heading us that way on Communion Sunday. The sermon should be to focus on some part of that. And so um, today and for the rest of the year, I'm going to do a series, Communion series on the first Sunday of the month. And the title of the series is, What's in it for me? Now let me explain that. That, that is not selfish. But I just look back over some of the sermons I've done on Communion Sundays, and they've been about the sacrifice of Christ or the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross and kind of what Christ went through for us, and that's important. Would you agree? Yes. Communion's about Christ. And I want you to think just about this this morning. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and he was bleeding, one drop of his blood that trickled down his leg and off of his foot to the sand below, one drop of blood was enough to wash away the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future. That's how powerful his blood is. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And like Andre Crouch's song says, it will never lose its power. Never. So we've always tried to focus on what Christ has done. But this week, and I kind of got the... In burden in my heart or feeling in my heart that we ought to look at it from a different angle this year. Christ did all that, yes. But what does it mean to me? It's 2021. What does it mean in my life that Jesus died for me? So this morning, go ahead and flip the slide there, Danny. So we're going to look at this. Because of Christ's sacrifice, I have been redeemed and forgiven. I have been redeemed and forgiven by His grace. If you have your Bible, look in your Bible, or look up on the screen if you don't have a Bible um, with you. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, comma, the forgiveness of our trespasses, comma, according to the riches of his grace. Daniel, leave that up there for just a second. Uh, scholars differ on the, the Greek structure of this word. And by the way, I love the way Paul wrote. Ephesians is one of my favorite New Testament books. I love Ephesians. I love Ephesians. Now, here's the, here's the thing about Ephesians. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 is how God sees us through Christ and in Christ. You know, we're redeemed, we're forgiven, we're chosen before the foundation of the world. That's how God sees us in Christ. Chapter 4 starts with, now therefore walk worthy of the manner. So chapter 4, 5, and 6 is how God wants the world to see us. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 doesn't make any sense if we don't understand chapters 1, 2, and 3. If you just started Ephesians with chapter 4 and says, now walk worthy, and it's just do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, don't do this, do it that way, do it this way, don't do it that way, do that, stop doing that, start doing that, it feels a little bit like a bunch of rules. But when you understand that because of who I am in Christ, then I should walk that way. Um, we used to say, when my son was growing, our son was growing up, we used to tell him, and I, you've heard me say this, but when he'd leave the house every morning or head out for something, we'd say, okay, now, who are you? I'm a baker. Okay, act like it. Don't embarrass me and your mama now. So because of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, okay, I'm a child of God, so act like it when you leave the house, 4, 5, and 6. That makes sense. Okay, so when you look at the whole book, that's what it looks like. When you boil it down to chapter 1, where this verse is, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, is in the Greek language, one sentence. Now look in your Bible, if you have your Bible, just scan Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Just look at it. Look at all those words in there. Look at all that. That's one sentence in Greek. Paul would be a good attorney. He could talk forever. And he, Paul was a very smart man. Very smart man. And God used his intellect to give us 13 books in the New Testament that are inspired of God, verbal, plenary inspiration of Scripture. It didn't come from Paul. It came from God through Paul. Just like Psalms came from God through David and other people. All Scripture is God-breathed. 
So as he breathed out verses one, verse 3 through 14, you see in verse 3, 4, 5, and 6 the plan of the Father. You see in verse 7 through verse 12 the provision of the Son. And you see in verse 13 and 14 the pledge of the Holy Spirit. So the triune God was involved in salvation. And that's just a piece of chapter 1, which is a piece of 1, 2, and 3, which tells me who I am in Christ so that chapters 4, 5, and 6, I can walk confidently in Christ. I know that I don't have to do it. Christ in me can help me do it. It's not me. Paul didn't say in Colossians, uh, you're the hope of glory. He said Christ in you. The hope of glory. It's always been about Christ. It's always going to be about Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So you look at the whole book and then you look at verses, chapters 1, 2, and 3. So then you go chapters 1, verse 3 through 14. And I want to shrink it down a little bit more. And I want to look at one piece of a very long sentence. I mean, I've done series, I've done series here just on 3 through 14. There's a lot of stuff in here. But I want us to focus on this one verse. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now look at that verse up here on the screen or in your Bible. You have, like, in him we have redemption through his blood, comma. The forgiveness of our trespasses, comma. According to the riches of his grace. Scholars differ on the structure of that. If that is, or is that three separate thoughts? Or one thought with three pieces? See what I mean? Is it, in him we have redemption through his blood, comma. Okay, that's a separate subject. The forgiveness of our trespasses, comma. Okay, that's another subject. Through the riches of his grace. Okay, that's a third subject. I think it's one subject with three pieces. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Uh, if you look at the next slide, Danny, put that up. I want to I track our time together this morning this way. I want us to look at it theologically. Or you could say historically. And then I want to look at it practically. So theologically, what does redemption, forgiveness mean, grace mean? What does it mean in the Bible? The Bible definitions of it. And what does it mean to me? When I study the Bible, I look at it this way. I could, I could have titled this sermon. I mean, I could have made this outline. Number one, what? Question mark. Number two, so what? question mark that's really inductive bible study observation interpretation is what application is so what so that's the way i want to look at it this morning from a theological or a historical perspective what does what do these words redemption forgiveness and grace mean and bringing it home what does it mean to me the word redemption here in the greek means i'm sorry the word Redemption, yes. The word redemption means to send away, to dismiss, to set free. To send away, to dismiss, to set free. Now, keep that on the back burner for a second. The word forgiveness means to discharge and set free with remission of debt and punishment. And grace is unmerited favor. I like the way, I don't know who said it originally, but I love it. Grace, the, the G-R-A-C-E, is God's riches at Christ's expense. So when you put all this stuff together, all these three words, you've got to send away and dismiss, to discharge and set free with remission of debt, Unmer by the unmerited favor of God to send away my sins, my transgressions, my weaknesses, my fallibility, my humanity, all the, all the things in human beings that we don't like about ourselves. And I don't mean your hair, your teeth, your I'm, I'm talking about our character, down in the depths of who we are. I hate, to, I hate to remind you of this because I'm very excited by the sermon, but we are born in sin started with Adam and Eve, and death passed upon all men for all have sinned. So we have this thing called sin that we have to deal with. How do we deal with this? Why is it so special for believers to understand this? We have a debt we cannot pay. Christ paid a debt he did not owe. We have 
redemption. We have forgiveness. We have grace. And it all goes back, if you, if you are a student of Scripture, it all kind of goes back to Leviticus 25. Now, don't turn there, but just make a note and read it later. But Leviticus 25 talks about the year of Jubilee. 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 Remember that word, how it sounds. Jubilee. The Hebrew word, yodel, yobel. Yobel. There are no vowel, there are no uh, vowels in the Hebrew language, but it's Yobel. It, we would spell it Y O B E L. Yobel, Jubil E. You, you hear you hear the Jobel, Yubil E. Jobel, Yubilee. Jobel, Yubilee. Jobel, Yubilee. Jobel means ram, and it refers to the ram's horn or the shofar. That, that the nation of Israel would blow for special occasions like the Day of Atonement. Now, I like old-timey, John Wayne-y kind of cal, uh, westerns where the, the cavalry, cavalry goes out and the bugler has certain sounds for certain things. Like one means charge, one means retreat, one means y'all come on home, y'all come on back, we're done. Um... One means time to go to bed. One means time to eat. They all had, and the soldiers who were trained, they heard those things, and they knew what it meant. I don't know, but, but the shofar, the ram's horn, was this, if you've ever seen one, it's kind of a long, curly thing, and it's hollowed out, and it's got a mouthpiece, and when they blow it, it's got a unique sound. And I don't know what the sound was. I wasn't there, but... I mean, I don't know if it was, I don't know what it was. But on the Day of Atonement, someone would blow the shofar every year. Now, every 50th year, 5-0, was the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee would start with, on the Day of Atonement with the blowing of the shofar, the ram, the yobol, year of Jubilee. Now, what was the year of Jubilee? Some significant things happened during the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years was the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, economic debts were forgiven. Now, just think about that in American finances. What would happen in America if every 50 years, everybody that owed money just said, okay, I don't owe it anymore? That, that the, the people that the money was owed to had to say, you're forgiven. Every 50 years, that's what they did. Every 50 years, land was restored to families who had sold their land in order to repay a debt. And every 50 years, slaves were so, slaves that had been sold to someone else into slavery, those slaves were freed. So the, 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 the year of Jubilee was amazing, amazing time. Now... Your mind is going where mine went earlier in the week. How would that work in America? I mean, it would be an absolute mess if all of a sudden, you know, every, every debt has been forgiven. I mean, I'd be all for it. But, I mean, just imagine. Now, what would make that work? What would keep a nation of people who are born sinners, what would keep them from taking advantage of these privileges? Because they started on the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was the day when they were to privately, personally, and corporately confess their sins to God and the sins of the nation before they would start the year of Jubilee so that their heart was right before their actions were taken. We kind of do that in communion. And I, I, I so appreciate Kyle mentioning this, that we, we are to take stock of our own heart before we have communion. Let me just read to you a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. In a sense, that's what the nation of Israel was doing. They were examining themselves 
before they begin to expect forgiveness of debt or grant forgiveness of debt. And because of the Day of Atonement and because of the spirituality of the nation of Israel as a whole, that's what made the Year of Atonement work. The Year of Jubilee work was the Day of Atonement. Now, what does that have to do with Ephesians chapter 1? In Ephesians chapter 1, again, it says... In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. When we come to communion, we come to appreciate the fact that God has sent away, dismissed, and set free me and you. From our sins. That God has, second definition, discharged and set free with remission of debt and punishment. He did not set me free but hold stuff over my head. Okay, I'm going to set you free but I'm going to remind you every day of how sorry you are. I'm going to set you free but you're going to kind of be on parole and if you slip up one time, you're going back into bondage. He sets us free. He redeems us. He forgives us because of His wonderful grace. We're free in Christ. That's who we are. That's who we are in Jesus. There's a place in Costa Rica I've been to twice. This place, it's Mount, I'm going to say it the way I say it, and then I'll say it the way they say it, because I'm from South, I'm from the South, Mount Arenal. Now, over there, down there, over there, over there, up there, Costa Rica, there, they roll the R, Mount Arenal. It's, doesn't it sound so Ricardo montalban Mount Arenal. It's cool the way they say it, and they should know it's their country. It's their mountain. But it was easier for me to tell you this story by saying Mount Arenal. Now, here's what Mount Arenal is. It is an active volcano. And the volcano doesn't run down all the way to the ground, so people are safe, but it goes off. You could, we would sit sometimes at night or look at our windows at night, and you, and you would hear... And you would see lava flowing out of Mount Arenal. I mean, it happened all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle. They don't know why it hasn't destroyed hundreds of miles of land. It just, as a matter of fact, at the base of Mount Arenal is a water park. Because out of, out of Mount Arenal is a waterfall. I mean a big one. I don't mean a trickle. I mean a big one. Have you ever been to Ruby Falls and you get there and go, Really? That's not Ruby Falls, that's Ruby Drip. (laughs) This is a falls. I mean, this is serious, beautiful, hard, pounding waterfalls. Now, if you've ever been on a missions trip, you know that if there are work trips, you're using parts of your body that you never even knew you had that hurt. Every muscle and joint in your body hurts. And we were doing construction. We were building a church with hand tools, wheelbarrows, no machinery, just making the mud and hauling it up a ramp with wheelbarrows. and I mean, it was just hard physical work, and it was fun. We spent a week doing that. So when you go on a missions trip, we always try to plan R&R. We're going to go shopping for a day. We're going to go sightseeing for a day. We're going to do something fun before we get on the plane and come back to Georgia. Well, this particular trip, we had, I don't know, 20 people with us. We went to Mount Arenal. Arenal. And it's a water park, so you pay to get in, and you, you get the towel, you change your clothes, you lock your stuff up in this locker, you've got the key, and you just go to the base of the waterfalls, and it's pounding hard. And when you put your foot in it, it's a little bit warm, but that's okay. And there's rocks everywhere. It's not man-made. They haven't done anything to it. It's just rocks. It's a, it's a waterfall with all, hundreds of rocks. So here's the cool thing about it. The higher you climb, the hotter the water. So you climb until you find your temperature. Isn't that cool? 
So some of us were close to the ground. Some of us were way up because the heat didn't bother them. And it's almost like a sauna with water. You just find your comfort place and you let Mount Arenal beat the aches and pains out of your body until you feel like a spaghetti noodle. <laughs> like by the time we were done, I'm like, yeah, man, I could live right here. If somebody bring me food, I'd stay right here. And this week when I was studying this passage of Scripture, I, I thought back to 1995, sitting at, in the waterfalls at Mount Arenal, just letting that warm, hot, pounding water pound away not only my aches and pains, but my cares, just sitting there. And what I hope you get out of this sermon today and out of this time together, I hope you see forgiveness, redemption, forgiveness, and grace as a sort of a spiritual retreat of Mount Arenal. That you just climb into it. You just get under it. And you stay there until you truly understand and hopefully feel that you get. I'm redeemed. Now, I got saved when I was, not, I was eight years old. I didn't, you know, it's not like I got out of prison or, a, you know, had bar fights. And, I mean, I was eight years old. But I've talked to so many people that have struggled with redemption and forgiveness because they have said, you have no idea what I did. You have no idea who I am. You have no idea of my past. No, I don't. But here's what I know from the book of Romans. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's what I know. And as bad as you think you are, God's redemption is better. As bad as you think you are, God's forgiveness is greater. So I hope this morning as you have communion, you just sit there and take it in. Just take in, let the Holy Spirit put you under that waterfall of redemption and forgiveness and grace. And just sit there and try to imagine, try to understand how absolutely, incredibly much God loves you. You know how much he loves you? He gave his one and only son for you. And I love that worship song back from the 80s or 90s, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. He gave his life. What more could he give? What more could he do? What else could God show you and me to say, Hey, I love you. I forgive you. I've redeemed you. I've, I've lavished you with my grace. Just take it. Believe it. And enjoy it. So, you know, what's in it for me? Redemption, forgiveness, and grace. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you that the next time we have communion is Easter Sunday. And here's what I'm going to talk about. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we have eternal life. Because Jesus lives, we live. Isn't that great? So there's so many blessings of knowing Christ. The blessing today I hope you take away as you go home today is We've been redeemed. We have been forgiven because of God's amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. And as we come into a time of communion, we truly, Lord, want to We want to understand. It goes back to Leviticus. We want to understand what it means to be redeemed. The debts have been canceled without any remission, that, that you don't hold our sins over our heads and rub our faces in it. And we're not on parole. We're free. You've redeemed us. You've forgiven us. You've saved us by your grace. So as we prepare our hearts now for communion, Bob's going to come and lead us in communion. As we prepare our heart for this special time, Lord, may we truly understand how redeemed and uh, forgiven and exposed to and filled with your grace we truly are and we pray this in the name of christ our sacrificial savior the one who died on the cross the one who rose from the dead the one who is making intercession and preparing a place and the one who's going to come back and get us one of these days it's in the name of jesus we pray amen